imagine that JavaScript would become so widely popular. It's, it's one of those languages that feels like the villain in a bad movie. They keep killing him and he keeps coming back, right? So it's pretty amazing how JavaScript has evolved over the past uh, you know, uh, decade or plus. Now let's talk a little bit about what are some of the reasons why we should be excited about JavaScript, but what are some of the really key things in JavaScript as well? Well, let's talk about, first of all, what's really wrong with JavaScript. One of the biggest challenges with JavaScript is inconsistencies in the language. It is something that works, but different browsers, different tools tend to treat it a little differently mostly depending on the complexities around dependencies and so on. Uh, what a poor name for a language. Would you do this to your children? Would you name a, your child based on some popular kid in the neighborhood? Well, at that time they said, well, Java is becoming popular, so they decided to give this the name as JavaScript, but now, of course, they are trying to distance from that name, so a really poor name that, that could be given to a language. It is often a misunderstood language. It's a language that is uh, often misunderstood for a number of different reasons. Now, let's be honest about this. How did most of us learn about JavaScript? We learned JavaScript by looking at code on the web. And we all can agree that JavaScript displayed on the web is pretty much it sucks. So we all learn from bad examples to know how JavaScript should be written. And very few of us actually have had the opportunity to really look at good JavaScript. So, but having said that, let's talk about what is really good about JavaScript. Well, it is actually a very powerful language. It's probably one of the most powerful languages that I'm familiar with. And the sheer power of this language just amazes me every time I use it. It's incredibly powerful. It is dynamically typed, but it is also weakly typed. What that means is garbage in, garbage out. You've got to be very careful because it doesn't verify type information at runtime, and you've got to be very careful about what types you're using. Well, it's a language which is flexible, maybe a little bit overly flexible if you really think about it, and it supports functional style of programming, but by no means can we even imagine that it's actually a functional programming. In fact, JavaScript is often considered to be a dysfunctional language, right? So it is a language which provides the functional style of programming, very, very powerful, definitely, and that can be really a pleasure to use. So we can create higher order functions, and we can also use closures and so on. But to me, the real charm in JavaScript is this thing called prototypal inheritance. And prototypal inheritance is really something that gives us the ability to do some fantastic reusability and power. We'll talk about this later on. But let's start talking about some ground rules we have to follow before we talk about uh, you know, writing code in it. Uh, as you see here, I don't really use slides in my talks. If you're interested, you can download the code example from my downloads link on my website. Uh, I will um, uh, flip this back here at the very end as well, so you can download the code examples anytime. So um, let's talk about some interesting uh, consequences that we need to be careful about in JavaScript. Well, one of them is that in JavaScript, it appears like semicolons are optional, but they really are not. So let's look at a couple of different examples here. Let's say I write a function called foo. Well, it's a convention that programming talks must have something called foo in it. So I cleared that checkbox, as you can see, with that foo method. So let's say we have a function which takes some value n. And I want to say here that if n is less than, let's say, uh, 5, I want to, uh, let's say what we want to do here. I want to return, maybe in this case, I want to say return n times uh, 2. And then else, I want to simply return uh, n itself, let's say. So in this case, I'm going to go ahead and call the function foo, as you can see here. So when I invoke this function foo, and I want to print out what this is returning, so let's call foo. And oh, let's go ahead and send a value, uh, let's say a value of uh, 6. Well, 6 is not less than 5, so as a result, it's going to return the value 6 itself. And sure enough, it did that, right? But on the other hand, I'm going to call this again and call with a 3. And of course, 3 is less than 5. So as a result, it should go through the sequence in the top and return uh, 3 times 2, which is 6, right? Well, not quite. It gave us an undefined. Now, so why in the world did we suddenly get an undefined? Well, that's because JavaScript says, well, I'm looking at line number 3. 
and you don't have a semicolon in the very end, it says, let me do you a favor and puts a semicolon for you, right? Nice guy gesture, isn't it? Well, the way JavaScript works is it analyzes every single line, and if the next line can be an independent expression, it automatically throws in a semicolon for you. So if I write this, for example, as return n, and then a star two on the next line, you can see it gave a different result because it doesn't make sense to start a particular expression with the star two. So JavaScript says, oh, so I better not put a semicolon at the end of the previous line. So the model of the story is you gotta be very careful how you deal with semicolons and you may have some surprises when you write code and it's a good idea to not only put semicolons but also make sure that sentences or expressions are ending properly as well as you write code with it. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Let's talk about variables for a minute. Let's say we go back to this particular code, and I'm gonna say within this code var local equals, let's say, five, and I'm going to go ahead and print the variable called local. So I'm calling the function foo, and when I run the function foo, it did print the variable local, as you can see right here, when I call this function. Well. Of course, the question is, can I access the variable local right here? And the answer is no, we cannot. Not because we called it local, it is because we defined it using a var. And so a var is a keyword to indicate that it is a local variable. Now the question is, in this case, if I try to access local outside here in the main code, it gave us a clear error saying, I don't know what you're talking about, I don't have the variable local, it gave us an error as you can see right there. However, what if I were to define a variable here, let's call it as sum equals, let's say six, and I'm going to go ahead and uh, print out the variable sum here as well, and I call foo and you can see the variable sum with the value of six was printed. Now clearly we saw we cannot access local here, it gives us an error, but the question is what happens if I access sum? Well, JavaScript says, oh, you were a good citizen, Venkat. You put var in front of this variable local, but guess what? You forgot to put var in front of sum, and JavaScript says, what can I do to hurt Venkat the most? And it realizes that would be to make the function variable global, isn't it? Because global variables are really awful, they're really bad. So you can see that the variable sum became a global variable. So the consequence of this is when you do not put variables as var, it ends up making the variables global. And as you can see, that can be a disaster. So we gotta be really careful when declaring variables. It's better to declare them as a var. Well, you can also turn on option strict and make sure these kinds of errors are you know, uh, given to you when you are running the code so that they don't just slip by. So be very careful to make sure you declare variables as var when you write code. Now, what about writing functions? Well, there are about two and a half ways of writing functions. And I'm gonna talk about what those two and a half ways are. One of the ways to write a function, and you probably have seen this quite a bit, is to say function foo, and then you provide a value here, and then within this, of course, you could print out whatever the value is that you can say, for example, you can say uh, foo called width, and then you could say what the value is and print out. So in this case, we'll call it uh, foo one, and so foo one was called with that particular value. We could call this with uh, foo one and let's say send a value of six, and you can see it says foo one called with six. This is probably the most traditional way you have seen this particular function being written, and I highly recommend that you do not do this. And the reason why this is not a good idea is that in this particular case, you are combining two separate things into one, and if there's one thing we have learned in software development is mixing two things into one place is continuously a bad idea, right? We have learned this lesson over and over and over. Now, what are the two things that are mixed in together here? It is mixing in the definition of the function and at the same time mixing in the variable called foo1 being brought in. I'll explain to you why this is a bad idea. And the reason this is a bad idea is, imagine now that I've written foo1 right here, and I'm gonna say foo1 called with n, 
Then I write over here a function again, foo1, and this time around, I'm going to go ahead and say here, uh, let's say I'm going to say foo1 uh, redefined the width, and I'm going to say n, and I'm going to call foo1 once again with the same value. Now, notice that I wrote foo1 in the first place, called foo1, and I redefined foo1. This time I said foo1 redefined, and then I'm calling foo1. So the question really is, what is going to be the output of this code? But more important, my question would be, what would you like to see as the output in this code, right? Most likely we would like to see foo1 called with six, and then foo1 redefined with six. That's what we would like to see. But when I run this code, notice, that's not the result we are seeing in this case. And the reason for this is, of course, this is a total mess up. But in JavaScript, we never say it messed up. We always give cool names. This is called hoisting, right? Because that feels a lot better than being messed up. Well, what is hoisting? Hoisting really is that you have defined the variable foo1 up in the top, but you have redefined the variable foo1 here. But because it's a function definition, you can think about this like a two-phase parsing, if you will. So as the code is parsing through, it is looking for a definition of a function called foo1. In a way, the second foo1 is hiding the first foo1. That's basically the hoisting of the function itself. But by separating these two, we can avoid this problem. So I said there are two and a half ways to define functions. I'm discouraging this way of writing function. Even though you see most people write function like this, it is better to write function as a var foo equals and then you say function, and then you specify whatever you want to specify in here. For example, I'm going to say foo called the width, and let's say in this case the value n. So now I'm going to call the function foo. Let's pass the value 6 here. You can see it says foo called with 6. Now I say foo equals function n. And this time around, I'm going to say uh, foo redefined width and specify the variable n. And then, of course, I'm going to call this function one more time. And you can see in this case, it behaves exactly like the way we would like it to behave. And this is the reason for this is we explicitly define the variable called foo and attach that variable to this function on line number one. And when it came to line number seven, we are not creating a new variable foo. We are using the variable foo that we already have. But in this case, we are assigning a new function value to it. As a result, there is no problem of hoisting because we are not re-hoisting that variable in this particular case. This is my preferred way of writing functions. And the reason for this is twofold. We can eliminate these kinds of mess of the hoisting problem. And the second reason why I like this approach is that in this particular case, it's very clear to say that we are defining a function and attaching this function to this variable, which means because we can pass functions to other functions as well, this syntax becomes a very consistent syntax we would begin to use we can create a function the same way, whether we are assigning it to a variable or we are simply passing it to functions as well. It gives us a very consistent syntax. Now, I did mention there are two and a half ways to write functions. I showed you two ways. What's that other half way? Well, Sometimes people do the following, where they define a variable, and then they also put a variable here. This is usually people who are working for the so-called department of redundancy, right? So you don't have to do this. This is very redundant, and I recommend not to do this. And I'm sure people will give you reasons why they do it, but most of those reasons are bogus, so there's no real reason to really provide that variable name. And that's the half way that I discourage you from using it as well. So this is a better way to define functions over Overall. So we talked about the two different ways to define functions. But let's talk about arguments to functions real quick. Now let's say for a minute, I am going to define a function called max, and the function max says function a comma b, and then I'm going to say here, if a is greater than b, return a, otherwise return, let's say, a b over here. So I'm going to call this function max over here, 
Let's say I'm going to pass a 1 and 2. Clearly, it said 2 is the maximum. I'm going to pass, again, max with, let's say, 4 and 3. And clearly, it said 4 is the maximum. So that's great so far. But the question is, what's going to happen if I call max this time, but I'm going to call it with a 7, let's say 1 and 2, what is it going to do? Well, notice in this example, I am actually calling it with three parameters rather than the two parameters. Now, if you program in languages like Java or C Sharp or C++ or one of the other languages, What's going to happen on this particular line of code? You will get a stern compilation error, right? And the compiler will spit at you, scold you, and say, what are you thinking? I only need two parameters. Why are you sending me three? Well, what's JavaScript going to do? If I run this code, notice JavaScript did not complain. Look cool, it even worked. Well, the word worked is a misleading word, right? In some definition of work. But notice what JavaScript did, first of all. It didn't complain. So JavaScript treats you like a guest in its house, right? If, you, if a guest comes over in your house and they leave stuff anywhere, what do you do? You don't tell them, you don't leave stuff here, take it away, right? You kind of smile at them, say, don't worry about it, we'll take care of it, right? You probably think they are stupid, but you never tell them that, right? That's how you treat guests. Well, JavaScript treats us like a guest in the house. It doesn't complain to us. But that doesn't mean it's doing the right thing. In fact, this is a bit misleading. If you notice over here, if I send a 9 over here, notice it still said 7. Why? Because it seemed to have ignored the last parameter we sent. Well, in reality, it really didn't ignore the last parameter. Something else is happening. Well, what is really happening in this particular case? Let's first ask the question, how many parameters can you send to a function in JavaScript? Well, let's ask that question for Java, C Sharp, C++, Ruby, almost every other language that we normally use. Well, the number of parameters you can pass is the number of parameters the function is taking. That's not the way it is in JavaScript. In JavaScript, the number of parameters you can pass to a function is the number of parameters you want to pass to a function. You decide what that is. You want to pass three parameters? Pass three parameters. You want to pass seven? Pass seven. You rule when it comes to JavaScript. So in this particular case, I can call max and pass one and two. I can call max and pass you know, three and four, uh, four and three. I can also call max and pass, let's say seven, one, three, nine, and four. I can do all of these. But then the question is, how do we deal with this? Let's understand one thing very clearly. This is not a parameter list at all. Now imagine for a minute that I know the names of, let's say, the first two people in the, row, in the first row here. But how silly would it be for me to say there are only two people in the front row? Obviously, these people are going to be very upset, and they're going to say, are we invisible to you or what, right? But it's likely that I only know the name of two people in this room, but maybe I don't know the name of anybody else in this room, but doesn't mean they are not here. So essentially what this means in JavaScript is you decide to give the name for the first two variables, but the other variables could certainly be there in the parameter list. So the question is, how do you really get to all the other parameters? Notice now, I'm going to simply change it to max called for a minute, and I'm going to remove this. Uh, well, and then let's return a one for a minute. When I run this notice, it says uh, max called so much, so many times, and you can see that max called for each one of these. And so even if I don't define anything over here, I'm still able to call it. So what's happening? Well, what's really happening is I'm going to say call the width, and the arguments that you pass to a function are really available using a particular object called arguments. So arguments is an object that really contains all the parameters that you actually pass to a function in JavaScript. So if you give a name called A and B, it simply means that you decide to give special names for two parameters, but that doesn't say anything about the number of parameters. It's possible you have more parameters than A and B. It's possible that you have fewer parameters than A and B. In that case, you will have maybe A given and B is undefined. So 
though it's simply a symbolic name that you chose to give, doesn't say anything about the number of arguments you have. So in this case, I'm going to print out, let's say, arguments 0 for a minute. And notice it's 1, 4, and 7 are the arguments in this case, because 1, 4, and 7 are the first arguments. So now notice what I can do. I can say large equals, let's say large equals arguments 0. And then, of course, I can return from here the large itself. So I'm returning 1, 4, and 7 in each of these cases, which is not the right result. But then I can say for i equal to 0, i less than, let's say, arguments dot, let's say, length over here, and then i plus plus. And then I could say over here, if the large is less than arguments at i, uh, then I would say, in this case, uh, large is equal to arguments at i. So we could start writing code like this, and we can start working with the real arguments being passed in. I got a little quiz for you. I made an error on line number three. Do you see what the error is? That's correct. Thank you. So you can see that I forgot to put var over here. So here is a fun fact. Write a function, write a for loop, don't put var. Within that for loop, call another function. In that function, put a for loop and use i and don't put a var in it. That would be a nice afternoon debugging that code, right? Because it will start messing variables everywhere. So if you don't really like somebody at work, write this code and give it to them and walk away and see them suffer for the rest of the afternoon, right? So var is very important in this case. That's absolutely true. So you can see how arguments actually work. So in JavaScript, the real parameter list a function actually takes is the arguments variable. That is the one that takes the parameters of this function and works with it. So the names that you provide really are really inconsequential. So for example, if I print out over here, the variable a, notice that the variable a in this case is the first argument in each of these cases, 1, 4, and 7. But you don't really care to use a. That's perfectly fine. You can ignore it. So this is really not a big deal. Now, why do you normally give a variable name? You normally give a variable name to say, here's how much I'm expecting. But if you don't put any arguments, that doesn't mean you don't take any arguments. You could actually be taking quite a number of arguments, as you can see in this particular example. And so you got to be really familiar with what the intention of this function is. So that is about arguments. Now, this is very useful uh, to associate, uh, well, this actually, the word this itself, is something that every object contains and is very useful to associate functions with instances. Now, you may think about this and say, why would I want to use something like this? So to understand this, let's say we have a function again. And within this function, I'm going to print over here a special variable called this. If I call foo right now, you can see it actually prints some large amount of data. So what in the world is this? Every function in JavaScript has two things now. Every function in JavaScript has arguments. We saw that a minute ago. But every function in JavaScript also has the special variable called this. A special variable this is a context object. So you can pretty much take any JavaScript object and you can attach it to a context object and say, run in this context. So it turns out that every object, every function has a this. And when you use it in the context of functions that belong to a class, that's where the this actually plays an important role. Well, it doesn't make sense when it's a standalone function. However, we can start using this in a couple of different ways. Let's say we have an A and a B here. And I'm going to go ahead and print out, in this case, the variable A and the variable, let's say, B over here. So we could say we are calling this with two variables, A and B, let's say 1 and 2. But there are other ways to call this particular function. You could call foo, for example, and use a special function called the apply function. The apply function is useful to, invo excuse me, to invoke a function. And to the apply function, the first parameter 
would be the context object. So in other words, the apply here is the this that you would see within that particular function. So for example, if instead of sending a null, if I say hello over here, and if I then say comma, and I send one and two, you would notice in this example, it still printed one and two. But what about this hello, however? Notice in this case, if I print the this, it printed hello in so many different ways, and that is because the hello that it prints is actually the first parameter that you are passing. So when you call the apply method, the first parameter you're calling is that this implicit variable. So what this means is, when you use a function in the context of an object, JavaScript is going to do quite a bit of effort. We'll come back and talk about this in just a few minutes. Now, rather than doing this, we could also call foo with the method call, function called call, and the call function also takes the first argument as the this parameter. But what is the difference between apply and call? In both apply and call, the first parameter is the this parameter. But the second parameter for apply is an arguments collection, like an array. Whereas in the case of call, you would send them discreetly as separate values, as you can see. So the question is, do you have a collection, an array of parameters? If you have an array, simply send it to apply, and that array goes as arguments array. But if you have discrete values on your hand, you can then call call, and then that would become individual parameters wrapped into the arguments as well. So it gives you that flexibility to call any way you want to, and that's how it's going to go ahead and send it. But keep in mind this method called, function called a call, because a call and apply are the ways you can bind uh, this context object. When you call this without the call or apply, you don't have the context binding object called this. So those are some two special methods available in the case of JavaScript. Now, let's quickly talk about higher order functions. Higher order functions are functions that can receive other functions as parameters. So for example, I could say list equals, let's go ahead and say one, two, three over here. I can say list dot each over here, and I can provide a function where I'll take an element as a parameter, and I can start printing the values for these parameters in this case, right? So uh, you can start writing different functions. Oh, you know what? So I'm not sure what that function name is. How do I find it? Well, this is one of the other things I want to bring up here. The technology has evolved so much that there are some really fantastic uh, you know, tools and benefits we have available. So typically by now, somebody usually raises the hand and says, how the heck are you running this code so far? So I'm surprised nobody asked me that question yet, so I'll volunteer that myself. I'm actually using Node right here. So Node is just a server-side JavaScript tool. I'm just running this code with the node. So I'm going to say list equals one, two, and three, and I'm going to say list dot over here, and you can just hit a little tab, and you can see that it's listing all the functions available, and you can see the for each available right here. So this is a, a node's REPL, and the REPL is a nice tool where you can type in some little JavaScript code play with it. So notice in this case for each function element, and then I'm going to simply say given this element, I want to print out the element right here, and then I'm going to close this down, and this is the end of that particular element, and the, right there is the end of the function. So I'm doing an interactive coding here in the REPL, but I can do the same thing here as well in the code. So I could simply say for each, and that is printing the values as you can see. So this is an example of how we could use a higher order function. So what's a higher order function? A for each is a higher order function because it receives as a parameter a function itself as, as what you can pass over here. So notice this is the function we are sending to the for each. So that's the functional style of programming in JavaScript where you can pass a function to another function. You, similarly, you can do other operations like, for example, filter. And you can say, I only want to get values that are of a certain value. For example, return, you could say element mod 2 is equal to 0. So this could be a filter operation. And then you can print the result 
result of that operation right there, and you can see that it only gave us two, because two is the only even number. So you can use all these kinds of fancy methods like filter and reduce and for each and so on, and you can do functional style of programming with this as well. However, there are a few other cautionary things we have to be careful about. Now, let's think about this for a second. Can we agree to this statement? If A is equal, let's say equal uh, to B, uh, to B, and B is equal to C, then we can say that A is equal, so is equal to C. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, absolutely, right? That's called transitivity, right? So transitivity says if these two are equal and these two are equal and these two are the same, then the last two guys are actually equal. Well, that's great. So we can say in that regard that one is equal to, let, let's actually say one, uh, one is equal to one. And notice what JavaScript says. True, why not, right? Absolutely. Then I'm going to say that 1 is equal to 1.0. And what does JavaScript say? Sure, why not? Now you say, well, in that regard then, 1 should be equal to 1.0. Because we agreed to that rule a few minutes ago, didn't we? And no. So notice the broken double equality. So model of the story, do not use double equals in JavaScript. Most of the code on the web, we'll use double equals. I have written code with double equals, right? But don't use double equals to write code with, uh, in JavaScript. So what is a better uh, you know, uh, comparison to do? Use three equals to. You, your colleague says, why three equals? You tell them you're really cool, right? You like to use three equals rather than two equals, right? So three equality, that is the true comparison in JavaScript. So the three equals is different from two equals, how? Three equals is the true equality. The two equals performs type conversion and performs comparison. So we should very rarely use two equals. We should always do three equals when it comes to JavaScript. So in this case, if I really wanted to compare, I could say is one is the double equal to 1.0. Notice that is true. Or on the other hand, if you give a string for it, it would say that's not really true because that's a string on the other side, it's not comparable in that regard. So you want to really, pardon me, three equals rather, not two equals, right? So 1.0, and you want to compare using that and not using a double, uh, 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 double equals, that's a better way to do it. So that's something to keep in mind. But functions really are objects as well in the case of JavaScript. Let's first talk about creating an object and how do we create objects? Well, creating objects is extremely easy in JavaScript. To create an object, you just create an object. So you say var, for example, sam equals, and then I could say, for example, first, and let's say, in this case, sam is the first name. And I could specify, for example, last, and I could say, you know, walker, for example, right? And of course, I could print out here uh, the object that I'm interested in, sam, and you can see that we created an object. You can even put methods in here. Depending on the SAM you know, some SAMs are very brave. They actually can sing in public. So you can say sing over here, and this could be a, a function, and the person could be singing, right? Uh, so um, you could, for example, say SAM.sing, and you can have SAM singing uh, right here in public, and you can call these kinds of methods as well. So SAM.sing is a function that I'm calling here. Let's see what the error is. So sing is a function. I'm going to assign this to a function variable right here. And then, of course, I'm returning, in this case, the function called Sam. So let's go ahead and call this and see what error it gives us. So Sam, da oh, pardon me, where's my variable go? Uh, so I'm going to say, in this case, ah, do you see the error here? Yes. Where's the error? There's an error in the object. Sign. 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 That's a sign that you shouldn't sing in public, right? So sing, thank you. So right there you can see the sing being called, and as you can see, that is a function within an object. So thank you for your help. Creating a function, an object, is extremely simple, as you can see in this case.
But how do we create a class? Well, creating a class is also very simple. Let's create a class. Over here equals function. And there you go, we created a class. You say, wait a second, don't lie to me. That's a function. No, seriously, that's a class. You say, no, that's a function. Well, no, it's a class. How do you say it's a class? Did you notice the uppercase C? That is a convention in JavaScript. JavaScript is laughing at us right now, right? But this is a, just a way to cope up with this complexity. If I use a lowercase c, that's a function. So notice I say car over here, and in this case, I'm gonna simply print out car uh, uh, called, let's just say called, let's just say called for a minute, so called. And notice in this case, I'm calling this function called car. Now, now I've created a class called car. That's how you go from a function to a class, right? Just by changing the case. Now this is kind of silly, but that's a convention. But what's going to happen if I call an uppercase C? It does exactly the same thing, but don't do it. And the point really is there is a semantical difference, not a syntactical difference. And the semantical difference is in the case of JavaScript, you don't create a class. Instead, you create a constructor and not a class. Now, what is a constructor after all? Well, isn't a constructor a, a, a object factory? So why bother creating class when you can create a constructor? So in this case, car is actually a constructor. So now notice what I can do. I'm gonna go back and say year, and I'm gonna say called, but then I say this dot year equals year. Notice the variable this. Now you know what the this means in this context. It is the context object, right? So just to kind of mess with this, don't do what I'm gonna show you in a minute, right? Don't do what I'm gonna show you. But I'm gonna say var foo bar equals and year equals zero, right? And don't do what I'm gonna show you, like I said. I'm gonna print out foo bar right now, and notice in this particular case, the variable foo bar is containing a year value of zero. But then I'm gonna say car dot call foo bar and 2014, and I'm gonna print out foobar, and I'm gonna say again, uh, don't do this, right? So just to illustrate the point, the context object we talked about, remember. So that this is the context object, so as a result, what happened in this case? It said, I'm gonna use foobar as the this reference, and it modified it. Now, and, and clearly I said don't do this because that's not the intention, but once we understand what a language actually does, then we get the command of doing stuff with it, and then we can use our wisdom to decide whether to do it or not, right? But the point here is still very important to carry over. You say var car equals new car and 2014, and now you print out in here car, and notice the car has a year called 2014. So now you should be able to understand what is going on here. So what's up with this? So let's understand what's up with this. So this should be very clear to you from the discussions we had so far. So this particular about command, so the about does three things. One, it allocates memory for the instance car. Notice the lowercase car here, right? Two, it then calls the method. So what method does it call? It calls the method car dot call car 2014. See if that makes sense so far. Right? That's essentially what JavaScript does. It allocates memory for the car, so it gives a little memory. What memory is that? Much like our foobar, right? So it literally allocates a variable like foobar. What I did a minute ago, that's what JavaScript does, except it's doing is part of the new. So it allocates memory for foobar, well, in this case, car. And then what does it do? It simply calls the method call, on the function car, notice uppercase C, and passes the first argument as car, and you know what the first argument for call is? It is this, the context object, right? And that's what it passes in. As a result, 
Now the car object has been populated with the year because we said this dot year on line number three. And I said it does three things, right? Well, the third thing it does is three assign car dot proto is equal to car dot prototype. We'll talk about what a prototype is in just a minute, but these three steps are really the steps that happen when you use the word new in JavaScript. So essentially new in JavaScript simply allocates memory calls the constructor with that memory as the context object, and then assigns the prototype for it so it can share the prototype. Great. Now, then the question is, what is a prototype? Well, let's go back to this code for a second. Notice in this example I have created a year variable, but then what I'm going to do is I'm going to simply say here that car.prototype.drive equals, and I'm going to say a function, and I'm going to simply say driving over here. Now if you notice over here in this example, I've, got, I've said car.prototype.drive equals function, and I created it this way. But then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say car.drive and call the drive method, and you can see that it's calling the drive method. So what's going on really? Well, in the case of JavaScript, every object has what's called a prototype. So what's a prototype? Think of a prototype as a little backpack that you carry around, right? Well, I've got a backpack which carries a lot of junk with me all along. You could come to me and say, hey, Venkat, can I have a change for, let's say, a few euros? Well, guess what? I'm here. I definitely have change for a few euros, and I could give you change for a few euros. But if you ask me, hey, Venkat, can you give me a change for a few US dollars? There's really no reason for me to call, you know, carry my US dollars with me in my wallet but I'm not gonna say no to you. I will reach into my backpack where I have some change for US dollars and I can give it to you. So the point is every object carries a little backpack with it. But when you call a particular method, it can reach in and get it for you. Well, what this means is, if you look at the example I gave you a few minutes ago, notice what I said is three steps it follows, right? Allocates memory, performs a call with that context object, and what's the third step? It, the third step is assign the prototype to the prototype of the class. Well, now that kind of drives a few concerns in our mind, right? What that means is, if I say car1, and I create a car1 object, and if I create a car2 over here, equals new car, let's say 2015, now, what do we know from this example? That both car1 and car2 actually share exactly the same prototype. Wait a second, if those two share the same prototype, and we just a minute said, if something is not in the object, it's gonna go get it from the prototype, oh dear, are we in trouble? So let's think about one problem we may potentially run into and how JavaScript solves it. So what I'm gonna do here is, I'm gonna go back to this car class, and within this prototype, I am going to say, let's say we're gonna give a value in this particular case. And the value that I'm gonna provide here and is car.prototype. let's say miles, or our kilometers, right, equals, let's say, zero for a minute. And then over here, I'm gonna say, uh, you know, this dot kilometers equals, uh, let's say this dot kilometers plus the distance, where I'm gonna say this is the distance I'm gonna provide. Now, let's try this. I'm gonna say output car one dot km, and it tells us zero. The car one has not moved a bit. Then I say car two dot km, and guess what? That is zero as well. However, the next question is, well, I'm going to say car one dot drive 20, and I'm going to ask car one dot kilometers, and notice what it tells us. It tells us that the value is 20, but then I'm going to say over here car two dot km, and I'm sure your pulse rate went just a little bit up right now because you would be very angry if you drove car one, it actually dragged car two with it. 
But remember what we said, that prototypes are actually shared across objects. And you say, oh dear, that means that car one and car two share the prototype. If I don't have a value, it goes and gets in the prototype. Oh my goodness, JavaScript is completely messed up, isn't it? Well, thankfully, that's not the case. Let's understand this with a little example. Let's say for a minute that he comes over to me and says, hey, Venkat, I really need a urgent help. I need one euro. I got, just got to pay to this person here, but I promised you I'll bring the one euro uh, later today for you. So I give him one euro. He takes it and gives it to the person. In the afternoon, he comes back and says, you are a great help. Thank you, Venkat. And he gives me back this one euro, right? So now we have built a little trust between the two of us. Well, a few days goes by. He comes along and says, uh, can I get, borrow 100 euros from me, please? I'm in a bit of a hurry. Well, would you be kind enough to serve as my prototype for a minute? I, I think he said yes by his smile. So here's my prototype. And so what am I going to do? He says, can I borrow 100 euros, please? And guess what? I'm really sorry, I don't have 100 euros. So what should I do as a JavaScript object? Go to him. So could I have 100 euros, please? Well, I get 100 euros from him, give it to him, and what happens? He goes around, and the next day he comes back and says, oh, Venkat, you are such a great help. Here's your 100 euros. What am I going to do with it? Keep it. Does anybody have a problem with that? I'm not looking at him, obviously. Right? Did I make sense? If you understood what I just explained, you understood how JavaScript works. So in JavaScript, it is very important to realize that gets are deep, sets are shallow. What does that mean? He comes to me and says, can I get, please? Gets are deep. I don't have it. I go to him and get it. Sets are shallow. He comes and says, here you go, have this value, I keep it. I don't send it over, right? So sets are shallow, gets are deep. So notice in this example, when I run this code, the second car's kilometers is still zero. Why? Because when we set the car's kilometers on line number eight, remember set is shallow. So this dot km, where was the kilometers in the beginning on line number eight? The first time you call line number eight, the right side, km, this dot km, you see the right side, this dot km, right? That, this dot km, where does that come from? It comes from the prototype. But then you add zero plus distance, now you're setting the km, where is that being set? On the car object, not on the prototype, right? Because set is shallow, set doesn't penetrate down to the lower objects, so it's very shallow. So we can understand this actually with a little bit more digging, but that's how very smart JavaScript is. It uses prototypal inheritance. That's called prototypal inheritance. So it behaves like inheritance, but in a very smart way. So when you are dealing with objects, objects share the prototype, but any set is actually on the shallow object, the surface object. As a result, you can get nice sharing at the lower levels, but you can have differences between objects as well. Well, well, in order to understand this, we'll take a little bit deeper and look at it. So we saw how to create a class, we talked about prototype, but we can examine properties on the objects. So to understand the properties on the object, let's go to the car first of all, and in the car what I'm going to do is I'm going to say for, we'll say var prop in car one, and I'm going to ask him to simply print out the property that we have. Notice he says the properties are year, km, and drive, but he's a liar. He's really lying about his properties. Why? He's actually bringing to you his own properties and the properties of its prototype as well. Now you can, of course, ask for the value of this property. You can say car one, and how do you get the property? Let's do that before we go any further with this. So I'll come back to this example. So here are some beautiful ways to get to things. You can say car one dot year, so that works as you can see. But something else I really like a lot is you can do this, car one square bracket, let's call this as prop name. Why? Because there are times when 
in my code, I don't know the name of a property when I'm writing the code that may come in as an input from a web browser, for example, right? Or other forms of input. So var property name equals year, and notice in this case, I'm able to get the value through that. This is a very powerful capability, as you can see. Using a square bracket, you are treating the object like it's a hash map, and it's really a name value pair, right? So you can get the value out of it. So now that we saw this, notice what I'm going to do here. I'm going to go back and ask it to give us all the properties, but then square bracket prop, and that can give us the variables, the values. Notice in this case it said year is 2014, km is zero, and then of course the function is there as well. But then if I say car1.drive, and I'm going to ask it to drive some distance. Then I ask him for the same details one more time. This time notice that KM, actually let me put this up here in the top. This time notice that KM is 10 rather than being a zero. Well, that's good so far. But let's look for some other detail just a little bit. So go back to this code. There is yet another thing you can ask over here. And that is called has own property. Has own property is a way to query this object and say, is this your own property or is this a property that you really got from this other object, which is your prototype, right? So notice what I'm going to do here. I've got a property over here, but then I say car1 dot has own property and prop over here. Notice what it tells us. It says for year, true, it is my own property. But for KM, no, I was lying. That's not my property. That's my prototype's property that I'm sharing, right? And then drive, yeah, that's from my prototype also. However, if I go back and repeat this this time, but notice in this example, I'm going to say car1.drive10. Now notice the difference in this case. The first time, KM was false, but the second time, KM is true. And the reason is, sets are shallow because I said, so it is like you come to me and say, how much do you have 100 euros? You know what, I really don't have it, he has it, but I'm gonna tell you, yeah, I have it. But the next time you come and give me 100 euro, now I probably say, yes, I own 100 euros because I stole it from him, right? So that's basically the idea is the sets are shallow, but the gets are deeper. That's why in the first time, KM was false because the variable KM was in the prototype. But the minute I call drive on line number 17, and drive is setting the value for kilometers, and because set is shallow, the set ended up in the object, and that's why KM is true the next time, because now the object has the value. Next time you call the value, because gets are deeper, but if you have a value, it doesn't have to go look in the prototype, it'll get the value from your own object. Now I'll show you one more thing, and I recommend you don't do this. And this is a reason I say don't do this is, this can be a bit confusing, but nevertheless it's useful to understand some behaviors. So in this case I'm gonna say print car1 that has own property km. So I'm gonna ask him if he has a property called km. It says false. Then I say car1.drive10, and I ask him one more time, do you have it? And he says, yes, I do have it now because you call drive. But then I'm going to say over here, I ask him one more time. But this time I say delete car.km and don't do this unless you hate the people you work with. And now notice in this particular case, I'm asking you to delete this property right here, right? So I'm asking you to delete and get rid of this property called a KM on the car object. Let's actually see why it's complaining. Uh, let's see the error in this case. Line number 16, car, oh, of course, car one, right? So car one is the object I'm dealing with. And notice it went back to a false. And why is that? You went to this object and said, you have this property, yeah, and you just deleted that property. Now what does he do? He, since he doesn't have it anymore, he's going to go to the prototype to get it, right? And, and so you kind of knock off this value from this object so you can do this too. But 
Hopefully, this gives you an idea about the power of JavaScript, right? So it's prototypal inheritance. You can manipulate objects so easily. You can define marks on the object so easily. So testing with JavaScript actually is very easy if we exploit these power in effect. And so that pretty much shows us how the prototypal inheritance of JavaScript is working. So to summarize what we talked about so far, let's revisit some of the details we talked about. So first of all, I mentioned that the uh, uh, we got to be very careful with how semicolons are inferred by JavaScript. So JavaScript ends up putting semicolon at the very end of the statements. A, if you don't have a semicolon, and B, if the next statement cannot be a stand, can be a standalone statement, it inserts a semicolon. We talked about the need for using var, and you want to make sure you declare variables as local variables, and otherwise it becomes global. That can be disastrous. We talked about writing functions, and I mentioned that the better way to write function is using the var foo equals function, and that is a much civilized way to write functions. You don't have to run into the problems of hoisting, as we talked about. Then we talked about this interesting feature called arguments, where we said, when you call a function, the true number of arguments is what you pass to it, not what you declare up there. What you declare up there is just names you gave for some parameters. You may actually get fewer or more or equal number of parameters. Then we talked about the context object called this, and what the context object gives us is an ability to bind an object to it. Then we talked about using the apply method and the call method. Remember, both apply and call takes the first parameter as the this context object. The difference between apply and call is apply takes an array as a second parameter. Call takes as many parameters discreetly as you want to send. We talked about higher order functions, and we saw how we could use these functions like for each and filter and so on. And at the same time, I also showed you how you can use the REPL and interactively code on the REPL as well. We cautioned about the double equals versus triple equals and why we should only use triple equals for comparison most of the time. And then we created an object, use a JSON object very easily. And then we created a object uh, by, from the class, we talked about the prototypal inheritance. We understood the difference between a shallow versus deep, meaning the gets are deeper, sets are shallow, and how the reuse of prototype works very effectively. And then we talked about how we can make use of that to examine the properties of a class. And then we routed back to saying, well, if this is really an object being set at different levels, we can use the has own and find out where this property is, and we examined that. We also, as a side effect, examined how we can examine the properties of an object by using the for as well, so some of the uh, capabilities of JavaScript. But learning some of these details about JavaScript helps us in two different ways. It helps us to really understand the real power of this language. And where this has helped me quite a bit is, when I work with teams, I work with uh, quite a bit number of teams as a consultant, and when I work with people in a JavaScript project, Project, while they are struggling to understand how JavaScript actually works or a particular library works, knowing about these details gives you the power to know what's really going on. And also, it's a great tool from the point of view of testability because knowing how these objects behave and how you can assign a prototype for an object, right? So think about this for a minute. By changing the prototype of an object, you can actually change its behavior. For example, notice in this case, we got a drive method and it says driving, so car1.drive10, notice it says driving, but I can say car1.proto, and I can change this proto to some other object. We'll call it as new, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, let's assign it to a different object. We'll say, uh, you know, pro my proto, we'll call it my proto. And then in this case, of course, var my proto equals, and it has a drive method over here, and let's make this drive method over here to say, uh, let's call this simply as, oh, what do you want to call it? Let's say another drive, right? So you can see in this case, I can change the proto of this object. Now I can say car1.drive over here, and you can see another drive. So marking things can be very easy once you understand how prototypes work on objects as well. This gives you the power within a test case to really modify what an object really relates to, and this gives you a lot of power on your hand to really do active testing of JavaScript code as well. I hope that you found that useful. Thank you.